90% of young practices don't reach their second year. And the ones that do, don't reach their 10th year. Episode 148. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with Viviana Villarreal, the founder of the architecture and design studio of Mass Operations, who have offices in Mexico and in Hong Kong. Graduating from Tech de Monterrey in Mexico with a degree in architecture and a master's in design theory and pedagogy from SciArc in LA, Viviano has quite a bit of a journey career-wise, both geographically and professionally. He's traveled while working and collaborating with diverse architecture firms within the US, Mexico, Chile, the Netherlands, Denmark, Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong. And prior to establishing mass operations, Viviano worked for the Dutch firm OMA, from their Hong Kong branch office. Viviano is also in academia, having been an undergrad professor of architecture at the Taller Vertical Workshops with architect Augustin Lander in Tech de Monterey, as well as a repeat guest lecturer at ITESM and UDEM universities in Hong Kong. Viviano has been a repeat guest critic at student reviews for both HKU and CUHK universities. In this episode, which was recorded a little while ago now, um, Viviano gives us a bit of background in his experience of OMA, um, his role as a business acquisition leader, as business development director. Um, He talks about how his role began to shift um, from design into business development and then he discusses how he dived into founding uh, mass operations and we also look at his academic pursuits and how he and his company have been adapting to covid throughout last year so sit back relax and enjoy viviano villarreal This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Viviano, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. What an absolute privilege to have you on the show. How are you doing? Ryan, I'm doing good. How are you? Uh, No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am and have been looking forward to the discussion for a couple of weeks now. Awesome, awesome. Now, you've had a really fascinating, interesting, varied career right? I've, okay. I've, I've been looking through and doing my, doing my research and you know, I was very interested to see how you founded MX back in, when was it, 2008? Yeah, wow, and, that's a while ago. And how that was actually prior to you entering into OMA, where you were an architect, you worked on some fantastic projects, the Malingart, um, the Shanghai Global Financial Center. Um, and then you, then you started becoming the, the BD manager, the business development manager. A few years after that, yeah. Which is a super interesting role. Um, and so, I, you know, hopefully we can talk about a lot of that role and the sorts of things that you were doing at OMA and um, a little bit about behind the scenes. And then obviously more, more recently, you are the founder and director of Mass Operations and you've got mm-hmm. offices in Mexico and in Hong Kong. Correct. Fantastic. Great. Good. Well, I think the first thing then to ask is, if we go to that, you know, what you were doing in that year when you had MX Architects, yeah. how did that start and how did it lead into your, your work at OMA? Well, let's see, 2008, that's a while ago now, right? Uh, yeah. So that's 12 years ago. Uh, what had happened there was, you know, I had just finished my bachelor studies. I'm, I'm from Mexico and uh, I did all my bachelors in Mexico, except for a, an exchange a semester in Barcelona, mm-hmm. uh, which was amazing experience. And I had during my bachelor worked quite a few years. So I, I came out with about three years experience of actual work uh, between uh, um, exchange internships between summer uh, jobs and half-time, let's say part-time jobs. Um, so I worked with some very good offices with Felipe Sadi in Chile um, and with Search Architects in Amsterdam. 
So by the time I graduated in 08, I thought that I had, you know, a, a pretty decent uh, CV between my studies in Europe and my um, working in Chile and working in, in, in Holland. For me, like the Dutch were like the kind of the epitome, let's say, of designer architects. Um, yeah. Not to say there are not great architects all over the world, including the UK. Um, but for me, the Dutch, it's, it was funny, I was applying to Japan and Holland at the same time for that internship. And I wanted to go to either one of those places because for me, the Japanese uh, style of doing architecture, contemporary architecture was like obsessive about detail and obsessive about non-branding, no color, no materials, like super minimalistic. Mm. And coming from a culture like Mexico where it's all about color and texture and liveliness, that, you know, you, you tend to be attracted by the opposites sometimes of what you yeah. see around yourself. And on the other hand, so if the Japanese are super obsessive and super serious about their designs, the Dutch are like, they put jokes inside their architecture and they're going like, they don't take themselves so seriously. Even though if we talk about Rem, most people would think that he does, but they honestly don't. They are looking for an ulterior narrative with their designs mm. and they're very free spirited. And I think that comes because, you know, they have gloomy weather. So, you know, you need to kind of spice things up in a way. So I got hired at Holland and worked and worked at Search Architects, uh, Bjarne Mastenbroek, a great architect. Uh, people might have seen the Netflix series called The Most Amazing um, Houses or something like that. Oh yeah, Extraordinary Houses with, with exactly his, his villa, which, which I drew some plans for in, in, in Vals, right next to the Peter Sumthor Therms. Oh, fantastic. It's like a stone throw away. Yeah. That's his personal villa from the, the, the founding architect, Bjarne Mastenbroek. And so after that experience, I thought I could start my own, my own studio. The idea was always to start my own studio. You know, I always went into school thinking, when can I start my own studio? And I thought that was the right time. And of course, summer of 08, it's, it's the financial crisis, right? It's the GFC, the world is melting. But I managed to do all right. And I realized that I was doing all right because I was doing small renovations, mm -hmm. small extensions, uh, projects that were constant design but were never gonna get built because clients in a way were attracted to me because I came through a mutual recommendation. So that kind of shoe in the door. Right. Uh, but also I was cheap and young. Yeah. So I realized that I had to sort of just grow a beard and look a little bit older and let some years pass by. And I was thinking about doing my master's degree. And so I called up my ex boss, David Gianotin at search architects and asked him for a recommendation letter. He sent me his signature in a JPEG and he said, Viviano, put this signature on whatever letter you want to draft up, <laughs> you know, go ahead. But actually, why don't you come work for me? I, I'm no longer partner at Search Architects. I am now the new partner for OMA. And actually, why don't you come work for me at OMA from the new Hong Kong office? Oh. And I was like, what? So when I left Search in OA and started doing my stuff with, with MX Architects, which of course is a play on the Dutch studio NL Architects, NL from Netherlands, right? Right, right. So I, okay, I, had, I was into that beat, you know? Anyway, that was silly. <laughs> but uh, when I left, they were collaborating Search and OMA with a project called the International Crime Court, which I think was in Den Haag, which their submission didn't win in the end. Mm -hmm. But that's how Rem got to know David Gianotin. And they got up to a good relationship and basically Rem poached David. And so that took me then to, to OMA. So I was doing my own thing. I thought I wanted to get better clients. I thought I was not getting great clients just because I was really young. Yeah. I could have been wrong. That was my perception. Yeah. How, how, old, was, how old were you roughly at that point in 2008? Uh, 25, 26. Okay. I'm 36 now. So yeah, yeah 20, 24, 23, around there. I had yeah, just yeah. graduated. Um, so, and then this thing, while looking into applying for master's degrees, I was applying at Columbia and the GSD at Harvard, trying to get these recommendation letters, oh, this kind of job opportunity that I never thought I would be, A, working at OMA, B, living in Hong Kong, just got dropped on my lap and it was an amazing opportunity. And 
It was also because I had struck, struck a good relationship with David while I was there at, at, mm. at search. Actually, he had said I should stay, but I needed to go back and kind of sign my degree and do my social. We, in Mexico, to get your degree, you need to do 240 hours of social service. So you go teach classes to underprivileged schools, or you can wow. actually have to go sweep streets in underprivileged neighborhoods. And this is what private universities need to do to get their degrees. Wow. Yeah. I've never heard of anything like that. Good. You need to get 240 hours of social service and 240 hours of uh, practical experience on, on jobs. Right. So get your hours signed. Wow. But you cannot do 480 of just experience. You need to have 240 of that. It's kind of giving back to the community. Right. Got it. Got it. Okay. So then, so then you, you, found, you, you found yourself in Hong Kong. Where, where, whereabouts were you living in Hong Kong? Just out of interest. I had three apartments. They were all around uh, Sheng Wan and Central. Uh, my okay. last apartment, which I dearly loved, and I had to get rid of it last year. I, I, it was such a hard thing to do. was on Hollywood Road, right next to the Manmo Temple. I, I love know, that. I know it well. I grew up in Hong Kong. For a few, you grew up in Hong Kong? For a couple of years, yeah. I was from the age of about 16 to 18. I lived in Hong Kong because my, my father got a job out there. and I mean, I, that blew my mind, just being in that city. It was, it's such a extraordinary intense place of like cultures just mixing together and Hello? yeah, yeah oh, i'm sorry, sorry. oh yeah, yeah. It got a little bit lag. i love that city it's uh you know it's massive it's so dense you can practically walk anywhere you don't need a car it's actually a hassle sometimes to get into a taxi mm -hmm. the subway system works perfectly you being from london i'm pretty sure you have your complaints about subway systems mm -hmm. as new yorkers <laughs> And people from London do this. Oh, it's, the tube's never working. Oh, this, and, and there's all these signs like from this section to this section is under repair. The, the Hong Kong subway system is just amazing. Uh, whether a traveling point as a destination, Hong Kong is a great hub to get to know all of Southeast Asia. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. I've got great friends and I, I dearly love that city. Great, amazing. And, and your role there was as an architect working in OMA to begin with. And then how did, you, how did you kind of migrate into the, the dark world of business development? And Well, I mean, that was a long road. That was not right. just uh, immediately, right? So I was five years at OMA, which yeah. is, a, is a considerable stint. I thought I was going to be there six months and then get the OMA thing on my CV and cash out, right? Yeah. But uh, I didn't realize how uh, incredibly addictive the work is. So it is really hard work. However, I came in <clears throat> in what I would consider a privileged uh, situation. You know, I got hired directly by the partner in charge there, mm -hmm. who I had a great relationship prior to this, yeah. a working relationship and a friend relationship. When I was with David at Search, I uh, brought him to Mexico to lecture at my hometown university, mm -hmm. but I couldn't come because I had to stay working in Amsterdam. So he got to meet my parents and all my colleagues and all my professor here. And he had a great time. Amazing. Um, so, I mean, it, it was kind of a friend and boss kind of thing. So actually you could tell there was sometimes resentments from some colleagues that didn't have that. Yeah. And you know, you're like, okay, well, but I always tried to be as obviously as professional as possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was a good, it was a good situation. The work is amazing because you realize that anything that you're working on, uh, reporters are interested in and that that's not normal, you know? So you would, and also Hong Kong, it's such a finance hub. You know, everybody in Hong Kong is in finance. And so you're out in the bars and you go out and the typical stuff that happens is like, people ask you, oh, where are you from? Um, uh, what's your name? Where are you from? And what do you do? Kind of thing. And, you know, by the time they got to me with my group of friends who were all in finance, they were like, oh, so what bank do you work for? And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't work for a bank. It's so, oh, so like private investment, cause like, no. I'm an architect. And they would look at you like if you were a, 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 this archetype of Jesus Christ, a carpenter, you know, an artist. It's like, who is this person? Uh, so it was a great city. The work was intoxicating. Mm -hmm. And I loved it so much. And I had a really good network of friends. And I just stayed five years, which was insane. But as track, I came in as a junior architect. And my first project, which was my main design project, was the Taipei Performing Arts Center, yeah. which has had a tough... Tough, um, tough life getting built because the contractor went bankrupt and it's a public project. It's paid by the government. So it was a big mess finding a new 
contractor to step in and take over the half built site. So it was delayed for almost two years. Right. It should be finishing this summer. However, you know, COVID, let's see what happens to live performances, right? It's three theaters plugged into one building. Uh, so I started there as a junior architect. This is the one with, then, the, with, the, with the giant sphere on the, in the inside of it. Yeah. yeah. So there's two boxes and one sphere in the middle and it's a yeah. glass cube. So I started working that as a junior architect right after OMA had just won the competition. And this was amazing because it was, it was tough. Because the competition team who I met the first day I arrived at Hong Kong had had this great idea that when they were submitting the panels, they realized that they were 10% over the GFA allowed for the competition. So they just grabbed all the plans and scaled them 90%. <laughs> so that meant that <laughs> chairs for a theater were 10% too small for a standard chair. Of course, we had to fix everything. I mean, all the structure was 10% too small. You know, car parking slots were 10% too small. It goes on and on. So went through all uh, SD, DD, CD presentations with REM uh, to the mayor, to the president, we had a change of political party. So if the new party didn't like the project, budget gets scrapped and it's never gonna happen until it finally went on site. And by the time it goes on site, I'm promoted to be architect, mm -hmm. which is a tough, it's a tough uh, jump between junior architect and architect. Not many people are given that shot. They're not even considered. Mm -hmm. And the Hong Kong office started growing. We started 13 people when I arrived. It was a brand new office. And by the time I left, there were 60 people at the Hong Kong office. Um, and so that's about two years in. And getting around the third year, I'm realizing that, you know, there's a few senior positions and they're highly contested. And honestly, I don't think I'm really at that point that good enough to be a senior at OMA. Yeah. I'm also starting to question because I start seeing some people that left OMA with a senior position and tried to apply to other studios. And, you know, if you want to get a higher paying position, like work for Acom or Atkins, one of these huge, like, uh, and, Gensler, firms, yeah. and they say, oh, you're a senior at OMA. That's like a junior at Atkins. Not because of, of seniority. It's about what aspects do you know? They, they would think that automatically, this is kind of stereotyping people, but they would think that a senior at OMA would be much more stronger on the concept side and perhaps on the leading of a team, but mm. would have no idea about CD drawings and sort of consultant engineering administration. Yeah. That might be a stereotype that's true. I don't know. I don't think so. But I thought maybe that's not the game to be senior. And at that point, the business development manager left this guy who was from Vietnam was doing BD uh, for the Hong Kong office. Right. And not too many people thought he was doing a great job. And he decided to go to Africa to write a book on something. And I saw the opportunity. I actually submitted a friend's CV because I thought he would be really good, but he wanted way too much money and he was not hired. And after that, I sat in the interview where I had my candidate for my position. And after that, I realized, wait a minute, I can do this. And I told David, my boss, and he immediately that day changed my contract and said, yes, you mm. can definitely do this. Don't worry. Anything you need to know, I'll teach you. Which is a great thing to hear from a boss, you know? It's yeah. like, okay, I can't go wrong. Yeah. And that's how the BD side uh, happened. Fantastic. And what, what does- my third year in. And, and, and what did that role entail? interesting a lot of things first of all entailed that all my design colleagues were like what the hell you know <laughs> that's the first thing that it entailed uh secondly the new staff that started coming in sort of stopped i wasn't dressing in a suit or anything i dressed the same way but they stopped realizing that i was a designer and they thought i was a business guy which i guess in a way meant that i kind of embodied the role i don't know yeah. But they would be surprised at design meetings when I would talk about design and sketch something and then talk about some parameter on Rhino. Mm. And they're like, wait a minute, what you like? Yeah, so, dude, I'm an architect as well. What was, was the previous business development manager, were they an architect? Was it, is it, is it typically a role that's filled by architects or is it normally somebody with a business background that would take that position? That's a great question. I don't think there's an answer to that. I'll tell you what I know. 
Uh, I'm pretty sure this guy had a bachelor in architecture, but I never saw him draw anything the year or two he was there. Right. The main business unit from the office for, for OMA, you have to understand that OMA, the headquarters is still Holland, Rotterdam. Mm. So you would have about 150 people there. So everything goes through there. And that's like the main brain. That's where REM usually is, but REM is also usually traveling. That's where you, there's a lot of stories about REM and traveling we can get into if you like. But then what they started doing is that all the satellite offices, New York got very big at some point, we started getting their own business development units because it was required, not just because of being local and time zone, but because of the culture and contacts. And, 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 and actually in Asia, it would be language. It would make sense that the BD manager spoke Chinese, but it was very hard to get somebody that had the Western culture sensitivities and good enough Mandarin and Cantonese for that thing to come together. We tried finding them and the people that were possible candidates wanted extraordinary amounts of money. So they're just kind of priced out of the role. Yeah. So the people in Rotterdam are not mainly architects. Uh, they do have architectural background, but they never worked at the office as an architect. I don't know of anybody else from my time, which is 2015 and back, yeah, 2015 yeah. to 2009, who was in a design role at OMA and then switched into the business development as I did. But then again, again, I think the relationship with the boss, in this case, David, with me, was an important uh, kind of chain in that, uh, in that movement. Yeah, right? oh, so it, it was, it's, a, it's a fascinating experience and to, be, and to be moving into that kind of role with the, with the, with the lens of an architect as well is very interesting. Um, so so what, what was your, how did your role then begin to shift and evolve and what were the sorts of things you were doing? And I suppose, you know, the, the question on my mind is like, how, do, how does OMA win work? Like what are the- Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, well, hold on. What, what is the role first? Because I didn't really answer that question. Yeah. So I, I guess you can split it up into active BD and responsive BD. So responsive BD would be, uh, let's say that you get a request from a client to come up with a fee. So we need to draft a fee proposal. And, and a, an OMA fee proposal is like a little booklet. It's not just like a Word document with a number. Mm. Uh, that's the final product of it. But the internal workings of that fee proposal has Excel sheets and man hour accounts and man hour rates and staff planning for teaming and all that kind of stuff. So that's the business management, whereas uh, sending out the fee proposal is a business development side, I would say. So that's reactive. And you might get requests that have to do a little bit with PR. Like for example, a client wants to come in and meet and see the office. You know, the business manager would handle that as well. Or let's say there's a request for a, a conference and David can make it. They would send me. Mm. Uh, there was also the reactive side. It was like you, so that's, that's the reactive side. Sorry. There's also the, the, the active side, which is you actually looking for work instead of just reacting to the request that you get. Yeah. And that would be, Coming up, I would have to come up with strategies, me, the architect, with strategies of like saying, okay, look, uh, there's a lot of development in, let's say, uh, Indonesia. Let's do a business development trip to Indonesia. So we start, the, the OMA research arm would get fired up and like look at all the developers in Indonesia. How many uh, employees do these developers have? How many, you know, all these beautiful diagrams. It's, it's an actual book on this research. So then oh, say, this, okay, is, this, is, well, this is music to my ears to hear that, that, that this happens. Yeah. And, and then it's like, okay, cold calling, cold emailing, get the contacts, talk to the engineering consultants and say, hey, Arab, we want to work with you in Indonesia. Tell us who are the guys who are building stuff and we'll co talk to them and we'll try to present our work. It's getting your stuff out there. Mm. Uh, talking to the consulates. So we would phone up the Dutch embassy and say, hey, we're a Dutch firm. We want to get work there. Who do we talk to? And so it would split up into those things. And there's a myriad of connectivities around those things. Have you, have you got an example of like a, a, a project that you were involved in where you kind of, you, you know, managed to hunt it out, if you like, and then bring it into the, into the office and what the process was? Um, well, yeah, we, <laughs> there's so many now. I, I, I think I had in total 60 projects that I worked on the BD side in total. Right. So it's, they're now, they go through so many phases. None of them got, the ones that were hunted out got into being built. Mm -hmm. However, many did get paid and went on to several phases. As architects, right. we know that yeah. out of 10 projects, 
one point gets built. Two gets built. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I have some funny stories. Like we would hunt out these developers. We would go and present our work, and then we would get these funny questions. Like, actually, have you guys ever designed theme parks? And we we're like, no. But then you have to say like, yeah, sure, we'll design a theme park. Why not? I mean, sure, we'll maybe we'll do that. <laughs> and then you would come out of these meetings like, what happened? These guys have. 20 projects for real for uh, residential and development. Mm. And they're asking us about uh, a theme park. Um, so, but we would do, uh, I, I'm struggling to figure out one in particular that was very successful. Um, many of them were through competitions. So then it's all about the strategy of the competition mm -hmm. uh, and saying, look, do we really want to do this competition? Because there's these five firms where one of the five and perhaps we smell that there's already a winner um, kind of yeah. organized. Yeah. You know, in Asia, several countries, I, I don't know how it is in the UK, after a development goes after a certain um, budget, the government requires them to do a competition, like out in the public, and to prove that several firms were bidded out, even if it's a private competition. Yeah. And so maybe the developer doesn't want to do it with X or Y or Z. They know who, they want to do foster, right? but they need to come make the whole theater of a competition. And yeah, you'll get paid a fee and you'll smoke that fee coming up with the design and the models and the, and the renderings and the animation. And in the end, you don't get the project. So sometimes you need to kind of sniff these things out. So right. there's a lot of conversations about that throughout the different countries in Southeast Asia. And, and, the, and the process for actually um, you know, signing a contract with, mm -hmm. uh, with the developer. How do those negotiations work? Because I'm always interested in, in the, the actual sort of how are proposals presented? Is it done by, you know, do you send these off to people? Are they presentations? Are fees discussed openly in conversations? And do you guys get trained in, in negotiating and sales? <laughs> it's tricky, 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 especially in China. And I'm talking mainland China as how it would be said in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can tell you that Kuala Lumpur, for example, we did the KLCC development that in the end, I think until to this day, so we're talking about 10 years, six years later, mm -hmm. they haven't announced the winner yet. But the, that came <laughs> in as a format that we needed to fill out and after that, we had to submit the little printed booklet. We had to send it back by post. Yeah. So, they can, so they had kind of, not our response, the, the, the empty one that they sent. So like we didn't have the ability to copy it or scan it beforehand. Anyway, a lot of protocols like that, a lot of submissions were like in boxes, like come to our office and drop your fee in this mailbox. And that was it. Of course, there was the other ones that were the presentations, but the important thing where they would say, okay, you present X day and you have 30 minutes and you have this room and the board will be there, right? You present your design and your portfolio and your fee. Mm. Now, setting up the fees. There was, I guess, a boom in around 2010 for, for China and probably earlier than that. Mm. And I think it coincided with the fact that there was this bit of a meltdown around the GFC the global financial crisis with the Middle Eastern project. So if we remember back in those days, early 2000s, every architect, every star architect at least, was doing something in Dubai or the UAE or somewhere in the region. And with the economy going down, everything stopped. And that coincided with all the projects coming up in China. So then the focus of the architectural world moved to China. Yeah. And what happened there was that, you know, Architects started getting better in China. And the, the way it worked uh, is that for you as a foreign architect to bid for a project, you had to have a local partner. And I don't know if I, that's pretty common over the world, but yep. over in, in China, the local partners are called design institutes. So let's say, imagine the, do you guys call it the RIBA or you say RIBA? Yeah, RIBA either. Okay. RIBA or RIBA. Right. So imagine RIBA per state in China right. or per city. But RIBA is also a design office. So RIBA gets to do their own projects. But if you <laughs> as a foreign architect want to do a project in, let's say, Shenyang, 
in some sort of third, uh, third tier city in China, you need to partner up with the local Reba there. And there's going to be about three Rebas per, right. per location. So what happened is that after a few years of all these foreign architects collaborating with these local design institutes called LDIs, these little <laughs> Rebas all over the place, they know all the internal workings of OMA, Piano, Foster, every single architect that's worked in China, they've got the Excel sheet man hour rates for everyone. They've got all the CAD Revit standards for everyone. So I was shocked in one negotiation with a client once where we sent our fees and you know, our, our fees are, sorry, are no, when I was at OMA, yeah. they're very well kind of marked out because you know, you're, you're building out four years of work. So you're even putting an in inflation into it. It's, it's not, you know, an easy thing to come up with there mm. on some metrics. They're very adequately measured. And at some other metrics at the end of the day, it's like, mm, how much should we just charge for this project kind of thing? So you've got both sides to each fee. Yeah. And the, the project manager came back at us and said, why are you guys charging X amount for REMS hourly rate? When so-and-so's, and he mentioned another famous architect, hourly rate is this much. And he sends us a screenshot of the Excel sheet of this guy's rates. And I'm like, this is insane. I'm pretty sure there's other parts in the world where this would be illegal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, wow. it's, it's kind of a wild west situation at that yeah. time in those locations. Wow. Extraordinary. Well, fascinating um, experience to be in, involved in doing that. Now um, contracts, contracts was equally interesting because we had an amazing person in the office. Um, she, she was part, uh, I think part English, part Chinese. Yep. And she spoke perfect. Uh, she was actually Australian as uh, Australian born, but she uh, spoke perfect English and Mandarin. And so she was our contract lawyer and she was, uh, I think she was versed in, in, what is it called? British basic standard law or English basic law? UK. UK, UK law. Which applies to Hong Kong, right? Okay, um, yeah, yeah, because it's, it's, it's an SAR and was, yeah. Still, <laughs> let's just say it. Oh, yes, it is. Still 2020, it still applies. Anyway, uh, so our contracts had to be bilingual. And the way that worked is that there's one paragraph in English and what, sorry, always Mandarin first, one paragraph of Mandarin and then the translation below in English. Mm -hmm. And that's each one. And we had, I, I don't read Mandarin, but we had to go over with her and make sure that what the client was, and there was back and forth with the contracts with the clients, you know, 40 times. You need to make sure that they didn't just switch some of the Mandarin symbols around and now it means something else. And we were signing a wrong contract. And something that for me was extraordinary was it a signature means nothing in Asia. It's all about the chop. Hold on. I don't know if you guys call it the chop there, but this is a chop. You know, the thing that you oh, the, like, the seal, like the seal, the stamp. Yeah. yeah. If a contract doesn't have this, it's not legally binding. And it needs to have every single page chopped. And this is what counts for legal purposes. They don't care about your signature, which for me was Mind blowing because anybody can duplicate these things. There's yeah. stalls in Hong Kong on the streets where, for like, you know, a quid, they'll get you one of these. Mind blown. But that's wow. how it works. Wow. Wow. Absolutely fascinating. Actually, if you look up OMA's original logo, it's, an, it's a company chop like this. And it came right. from like this realization when they were first uh, incurring into Asia. So the. the OMA at that, at that time, you said the office had grown quite rapidly in Hong Kong. And yep. when, you, when you left, it was around 60, 60 mm -hmm. people. Well, how did you come back to, to Mexico? Did you go back to Mexico? Or did you start up um, your own business in Hong Kong first? Yeah, well, I left <clears throat> to start my own studio. And I called my studio Mass Operations. And the reason <clears throat> it's called Mass Operations is because... Um, in the end, the final projects, I started realizing that we started, ex the one that I got to be a uh, sort of project leader on with, with my own team, mm. um, we started presenting everything as a series of instructions to follow, to apply to a certain kind of matter or building material. And that would sort of generate uh, space. 
many people know this as sort of the, the, the method for big Bjarke. However, of course, Bjarke worked at OMA. So it's kind of like, it's through it's that got, sort of got, cycle. Got it. It's got a bit of the DNA in it from OMA. It's in like. the family. It's in yeah. the family, yeah. And so I thought mass operations, a uh, series of steps that when applied to matter generate mat architectural mass or space. I thought that was an interesting way to name yourself as to how you present the work or yeah. work about. And I started with interior designs in Hong Kong. I did start moonlighting while I was still at OMA. So doing kind of Saturday and weekends, uh, lunch hour meetings with contractors on site. There's a tough, lot of interior design. Tough place to yeah. moonlight at, I'd imagine. What's that, sorry? A tough place to moonlight at, I'd imagine. Yeah, but of course, <clears throat> you know, by the time I got to be a business manager, the hours are not as insane as it is when you're a junior architect or an architect. Got it, right? got it. Because you can't be doing fees at 4 a.m. in the morning because you're going to get something wrong and you can't read a contract at 4 a.m. in the morning. I'm pretty sure professional lawyers do it all the time, but not me as an architect. Yeah. And you don't want to play around with that stuff. You can be yeah. moving around a 3D model and come, coming up with crazy ideas at 4 a.m., not fees and legal work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, moonlighting and started getting a few projects there. There's a lot of interior design in Hong Kong. It's very well paid and it's very quick. Mm. Uh, and you're limited by two things, budget and the size of the lift. Because whatever you design, if it doesn't fit in that lift, it's not gonna, go, it's not gonna work. And I learned that the hard way. Yep. Um, and it started going well. And the idea then was to do a remote office. So I invested the little money that I had kind of acquired and saved up like a little squirrel waiting for winter. Uh, into traveling between Hong Kong and Mexico. Now that's a 15 hour flight. Mm. And the reason was because I knew that it was going to be quite a few years of interior design and installations and talking about art with clients. Uh, you know, a lot of firms just do art installations for, you know, design events. And yep. it's, a, it's a living, but I wanted to do architecture. And I knew the fastest way to getting that would be to do my connect back with my contacts in Mexico. So back and forth. And I would tell my clients in Mexico, Hey, don't worry. I'm here all the time. And I would tell my clients in Hong Kong, Hey, don't worry. I'm here all the time. And I was sleeping on trains, boats, and planes and just kind of drawing stuff wherever I was. Got it. Slowly so, starting building up a team. So, so the, so the idea was that in, in Mexico, you were going to have more opportunity in, in terms of being able to actually do buildings as opposed to Correct. Hong Kong, which is pretty, you know, it's either, it's either skyscraper or nothing kind of, kind of world. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and it's a very expensive city. Yeah. Uh, now an interior design fee for a three month project, a 3000 square foot project in Hong Kong, one of the first ones paid about as much as a house in Mexico, which three months interior design in Hong Kong, four years in Mexico. However, for my personal well-being, for what I want to do, mm. I love interior design, yeah. but I really want to be in architecture. So that was kind of the focus. Try to get, even though I make less money, even though it's harder and slower and longer, that's where I want to be. Got it. And so was the idea to build up sort of cash reserves by doing the interior projects in Hong Kong because they're pretty fast paced. They're kind of quick turnover comparatively to architecture. And then that would be able to either finance. You know, finance finance what you want to be doing in, in Mexico. Yeah. I mean, it was never written in the business plan that way, uh, but that's how it ended up uh, working very quickly. And I realized it very quickly and I just put that in action. Also, uh, I started teaching the last years I was at OMA. So mm. I wrapped that up a little bit and, and, you know, it's a nice steady income to pay the rent and then you can focus on design for all your extra cash. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, how is the office um, articulated or what's, what's the anatomy? Well, until about a year and a half ago, it was still like that. Yeah. So let's say two years ago, it was still like that. And then I got the angst where all this started to go back to ground zero, let's say, and do a master's. Like I just said, I had started teaching the latter years at OMA because in Asia, if you talk to any dean or any professor, instructor, you said, oh, I may like, they would be like, oh, please come and teach here. Something. Just come and talk. Yeah. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, I started really enjoying teaching and enjoying the teaching gigs and the contact with students and thinking about designing a studio 
it's not just to go there and talk. It's like, I almost looked at it as a, as a play writer because I, I play theater with the students because you can't smash all your knowledge of architecture in one course. So you have to play like dumb in some parts and smart in others. And it got mm. really interesting. And I thought I need to do a master's now, which I never did because I got this job at OMA and then I started my office. Um, and I saw that SciArc in LA had started a new program called the EDGE program with three or four different master's degrees, fully accredited um, masters of science and architecture or however it's called. Um, in a year and a half programs. So two semesters in one summer. And funny enough, my commutes between Hong Kong and Mexico, because I, my, my office is in Monterrey, which is like the second most important city, but then all the flights go to Mexico City, not to Monterrey. The cheapest and fastest way to get to Monterrey was actually Hong Kong, LA, LA, Monterrey. And that's where Sayark is in LA. So, I did some layovers and went to check out the school and talk to the deans. And I'm like, yeah, I think I can do this. I can do. Sci-art. Sounds exhausting. <laughs> it was. It also was. My goodness. So traveling from two, two major cities with offices in both yeah. uh, and then doing a master's at the same time. And teaching. And, and I teaching. kept doing that until I got accepted at SciArc. Yeah. So the idea was, look, I'm going to apply for a scholarship. And if I get it, I'll do it. And actually there was this sort of like, oh shit moment when I got in and like, okay, now I have to do this. So at that point I stopped the Hong Kong office because I thought, okay, there's, there's a limit to things. Yep. <laughs> I think I found it. And, but you know, I'm in recovery mode right now, taking care of the projects ongoing that I, I went into SciArc this year and a half mm-hmm. with a hefty amount of projects that were in design and about to go into construction. And now these are topping out and finishing. And so after this sort of phase goes over, I want to go back and get some more projects in Hong Kong. But right now, recovery mode and this quarantine of COVID-19 came in right when I was starting recovering. Right. Got it. Got it. And so, and so tell me a little bit about some of your teaching, because when we spoke last, you explained some really fascinating entrepreneurially led projects, which again, music to my ears to hear design projects actually embracing the creativity of, of business rather than yeah. how education normally frames business, which is either it's totally neglected or it's not considered or we don't consider the viability of a, of a building. It's, and, then it, and then by that neglect, we just then think of money, finance, commerce, economics as being some sort of constraint and we never meet it until we're actually in practice. And then it's like, oh, <laughs> Why didn't we exactly. think about this? Yeah. See, the thing is that, that, that I'm going to get to this, but I want to give you some context to this. I think the ethos to my teaching, it has to do with my fascinations. I bring a lot of film. Mm-hmm. I try to teach the design of a building, the conceptualization of a proj- architectural project in class as if you were writing a screenplay. And trying to, I really want to hone in on the narrative of architecture. Piano has this great phrase that says, you know, have you noticed that there's buildings that tell stories and there's buildings that don't tell stories? They're mm-hmm. both buildings, they're both architecture, but just one tells a good story. Yeah. And you know, yeah. I think that's a good kind of uh, focus to, to give students. And it's a series of my fascinations with the architectural world and many degrees and my angst and my ego, and it's all sort of piled into kind of different architectural classes. However, what you're talking about and what's more, most suitable for this podcast, the business podcast, is this idea that if, if you are business oriented, you can't be a designer. Mm-hmm. Or if, that, um, if you focus on design, uh, design strategies, you won't be able to understand business strategies and they're at odds, which of course is ridiculous. Uh, um, there's a great interview by Enoch to uh, Tom Main actually, who talks about this. Yeah. Saying that it's, 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 uh, it's actually, he, he kind of equates it to the film industry. You know, it's art, but it needs to make money as well. And without money, you can't make your film. So I tried to bring in that and I tried to tell people, don't be put off by the idea of the word business and everything that can entails. Realize that that's going to empower your design because without money, you can't have an office. And without an office, there's no design. So I tried to bring all that in. Uh, and fight against that sort of, uh, let's say, stereotyping about the mm. business world. 
And so I want to show you something. Hold on. The studio which you are talking about has to do with this. And so this is fake money that I printed. That's Borromini. Again, one of my obsessions. <laughs> it's a, a 10,000 lira. Because actually Bernini and Borromini were both at some point in Italian money, but Borromini's was a very low count. So I gave him a higher number for, <laughs> for his value. Um, so what I did when I was at Sciarc, I was externally afraid of going into Sciarc because my background, yeah, I do rhino, but I don't do grasshopper. I'm not into, I don't know about convoluted neural networks and sort of this advanced technological side. And also it's, so Sciarc has this incredible push on the technology side, but an incredible push on philosophy and arts as well. Mm. And it's all intertwined. And I think it's amazing to expand your horizons and to find new stuff. But I think more than 50% of the time, then the architecture gets lost. Mm. And so then that's why you have these programs there that have to do with cinema and animation and more industrial design, you know? Yeah. And that's great. However, then at some point again, the quote unquote architect that wants to build stuff is sort of sneered at like what, and, and if you say in art in Sayark that to be an architect, you need to build, you'll get kicked out out of the classroom. <laughs> uh, you won't, but you'll be looked at like, mm, I don't think so. You can write, you can um, create philosophy, et cetera. And it's true. And it's true. But being from Mexico, design is not paid. What's paid is to build your stuff. And I, yeah. and I don't, and I, I don't have, contractors working underneath me, I hire contractors with my client's money and mm -hmm. I, and I administrate it. I don't have my own construction team as of yet, but 90% yeah. of architects to be able to survive, they need to build for the construction and not just design. So I brought all this and I, and I realized that what happens in school is that we're not taught how to lead a practice and 90% of young practices don't reach their second year. And the ones that do don't reach their 10th year. So they have a very short lifespan. And my take on that was because we don't get adequate business training in school. And it's mostly because of this antagonistic view by both instructors, deans, and students about the business world. And it's just silly because you're shooting yourself in the foot. And so what I proposed as my master's thesis was like, what if we can take all the information of what's called the PROPAC course, which just, it sounds terrible, the professional practice course. Everything about contract law, setting up fees, you name it, and masquerade that as a design studio, which is what every architect student loves. It's mm -hmm. all about who are you taking class with for your design studio? Who's your instructor? Who are your instructors? They don't care who's your instructor for the PROPAC course. Who cares? It's like, you know, black and white PowerPoints with Arial type font number 10. So all that information and just kind of put it into a design studio. And that's what I did. And I sort of printed out fake money and I made students, well, this was all theoretical. And then I actually enacted it and yeah. that's what made it very successful. And so the enactment was uh, fake money given at the beginning of class to students, ask students to work, not in teams, in offices. So they would come up together, join their portfolios, and come up with an office name of their joint portfolio. Mm -hmm. And there was three design assignments scheduled throughout the, let's say the workshop, duration of the workshop. And there was no grades. After each assignment, it was like a competition. There's one winner. And that winner would get a cash prize, not a grade. But every week I would deduct from them rent and expenses. So every week they're losing money. So I would come up to class. I'm like, guys, okay. You should have done it with real money. <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. I need to get a sponsor for it, I think. That, that would have really got people upset. But it's brilliant, brilliant. I love it. It was very psychological because, you know, you could see in their faces, they didn't want to give away the Berninis and the Borrominis. They're like, you know, they could see how this money is leaving because they haven't won any assignment. Yeah. And then there was a lot of disruptors placed. So again, the theater of kind of representing the unknowns that happen when you have an office. I just threw them in like wrecking balls into their, what they thought was a perfectly planned studio. Mm. And it was amazing. There was a point. What, where, what, what were some of the things that you threw in? That so this is one. Uh, it's standard for a design studio to work in groups, like to do a site model, a site analysis, and then break out to individuals and everybody does their own project, right? So everybody does their own project on the same site with the same program. 
So what I did is I just reformulated that and I made them understand they were going to be working in as an office and kind of, they set up their own Instagram with their office logo and name. And they were like really hardcore and they presented two projects as their joint office are really feeling it. And then one day they come into class and I kick them all out and I started bringing one, one by one and I hand them a letter. And prior to this, they had been given individual assignments. So to learn that there's alternate revenue streams of a team of three, I would give one, hey, you know, the local architects Institute has asked you to write an article for so-and-so and they're gonna pay you this much. Hey, somebody asked you to do like, you know, an Instagram post for this and this and this about talking about the future of architecture, or you're gonna give a lecture. And so these letters said, hey, your partners are pretty angry with you because you've been working on stuff that's outside of the office that's making you money, but not the office. So they want to buy you out. Uh, so you need to <laughs> sign here and you need to say of the money that's remained during your account and it had the remaining amount of what they've lost or won, how much do you think is what you deserve? Oh, and you can see the, it's all fake, but you can see these guys. It's yeah. all oh. I have to say all of this was videotaped because this was my master's thesis. So it was like a big brother thing. And they're going like, I mean, should I divide it 33%? What should I do? And mm. they had to kind of, and every one of those came in and had that and then left knowing that now an individual, they have no longer an office. And it was so psychologically charged that after that we had to have like a postmortem and I sort of have to break my character of this sort of, instructor but also kind of a big brother figure mm. say okay guys what just happened happens in real life but in reality in school this is what happens all the time and nobody cares but now as an office you realize that you were invested in this name and this name has a value and your colleagues apport value to the table and that's worth stuff and this can happen to you at any given time and it's better for you to live this now in here mm -hmm. than out there when you're going to go bankrupt and you have like a family to support. So like magic, you know, this aura of understanding. I'm like, yes, this is, why is this not in class? And actually that thesis, which was very surprising for me, was awarded the best thesis for that year, master's thesis. At SciArc, a theoretical design of a studio filmed uh, with real students in Mexico versus amazing parametric convoluted neural network animations and models that must have cost like five thousand dollars to make i was really shocked but it was a testament actually that there is a, a void in the education of an architect that requires something like this yeah absolutely it's, it's really fascinating to hear as well how well received um that thesis is and also what were some of the students um for the participants feelings afterwards about what they learned uh how was most it of them, by them look most of them i have become a bit of a of a sort of say mentor because mm -hmm. they email me most of the time like yeah no you know because in the studio i teach them how to come up with fees and i teach them about how to respond to an rfp and i take them into a developer uh, uh office and they give a lecture about rfps and the developer tells them what they want to see in rfps and told us what are the common mistakes that architects make this is a developer that hires Peli, Cesar Peli. So this is like a hardcore developer. This is not like a little tiny office. For people who so, might not be um, familiar with the acronym RFP. Uh, a request for proposal. Got it. Right. Uh, so that's what developers send you when they want you to send your fees back, right? RFPs, RFQs, RFIs, request for qualifications or request for information. Mm. And then you get into the acronyms like EOIs, expression of interest and all that stuff. Yep. That's all the business side, right? So they were very appreciative of all that they learned. They all say the same thing. Like, why is this not being taught in school anywhere? Like nowhere. And I learned so much and this has been very helpful in me starting my office and they all have their own offices and it's amazing to see. And they're like, you know, family to me. When this was presented at SciArc, Many students at Sarah came out to me and said, Viano, this is amazing. And there should be really more about this everywhere. Fantastic. I was love really it. happy. Love it. And, and so how, how has this kind of laid the foundations then for mass operations and, and what sorts of work are you involved with right, right now? And how are you growing the office? Well, uh, I guess you can say, you know, 
let's not start with COVID thing, but the business development side and everything that I learned with David Yenotin at OMA was not critical, essential for me to be able to start my office. I don't think my office would be still an office had it not been for that education. So I, I basically got at OMA a design master's and then a business master's in architecture through my five years experience. And you know, that's what I get plus covering my expenses as a young architect living in Hong Kong and the little money saved over so I can travel and put that into my business plan of setting up the office. And so understanding how a fee is created, understanding how to sell a project, how, what a client wants to hear, how they want to see broken up the, the fee, deliverables, time consumption, where do architects make money and where do they lose money? How do, uh, look, if you see, if you imagine your design fee as an oil tanker, you know, the, one of these big boats transporting oil. If, and this is very common for engineers, if the oil tanker had oil all through the tanker, any single little wave will just topple the whole thing over. So it's sectioned off in little sections. So they slosh about evenly and in the end the boat doesn't keel over, right? That's the same principle when you split a fee into concept, concept design, uh, schematic design, detailed design, construction design, and then on-site administration and supervision. And you need to understand where your money is. And it's gonna be different for my office than to your office. Mm. So when negotiating with a client, you know where to negotiate and how to move. Like, okay, you don't like my fee for construction supervision? All right, I'll build it, I'll bulk up my concept. Um, I don't know, I wanna do this, this project that you're asking me to do, but it seems to me like this project is never gonna get built. It's too early, so you know, I'm gonna bulk up my concept fee because I'm not sure this is gonna go after that phase. Or you have a client who is a developer who has a great building track record. He wants to work with you, but he's asking you to lower your fees. Like, okay, I'll lower my concept and I'll raise my CD fee, right? So I'm hedging my bets. Yeah. Never, ever, and I've seen this in a couple of you guys' podcasts, never, ever lower your fees when they tell you, oh, you know, we've got a lot of work. There's going to be a lot more projects. If you, if you say that, like, okay, great. I'll give you my standard fee right now. And the next project, give me 50% discount. Let's work it the other way around. And you'll see like, well, wait a minute. It, uh, you know, sometimes you can be pulled into the whole idea about be becoming a partner. And say, well, well, we'll pay you with an apartment out of this apartment building. And you need to understand, well, do I need the money now or do I want an apartment later? And again, out of every 10 projects, not even one gets built. So yeah. all these things I learned and have helped me with the setting up of my office. As to the projects that we're working on right now, so on the residential side, we've got a 70 apartment building, which is a 200,000 square foot building in the south of Mexico that's on facade construction. So it's nearing, nearing completion a small apartment building in Tulum, which I, I don't know if you're familiar with the beach in Tulum in Mexico. No, I'm not. It's I'm a sure, but I'm sure it's extraordinarily beautiful. <laughs> Go on Instagram, hashtag Tulum. And yes, it will be extraordinary. Uh, actually, when the pandemic hit in March, I had my birthdays in March. Right. So I was going to go visit the site, see the building, and then spend a week off, which after Sayark, I had had almost two years without a, a holiday. And it got all canceled with COVID, of course. So that building is finished. We still need to take the photos. That's a 12 apartment building. Uh, that's about, let's see, square foot, I mean, square meters to square foot. That's a 40,000 square foot building. Then uh, we've got a villa in construction as well, finalizing construction. The family, because of COVID, has actually moved already. So mm -hmm. we're just doing the final details. So now the details is going to take a long time. We collaborated with the next uh, collaborator from OMA, uh, an engineer called Stephen Melville, which is based out of the UK. He's actually out of Bath. Right. Uh, we worked a lot with him. He used to be the director for structure at Ramble, which is a Norwegian engineering firm. And he left to start up his own engineering firm. And he's amazing. He's worked with Anish Kapoor on structures and a lot of really good architects. So he did all the calculations. We got a, 17 meter span in that house and it all op opens up to a garden it's called the stair house it's wonderful 
So, in, so in, in, in mass operations, then, of, as being the director and, and the, the founder, yep. what's your role in this office and how are you building out your, your team? Are you, are you still very much kind of, you know, you are business development, that's the, that's the main role that you focus on. Are you still involved in design? And how are, you, how are you kind of growing your team and systematizing where you can? Definitely business development is not the main role. The main right. role is, in Spanish, we say todo logo, which means you do it all. <laughs> um, so the design is still led by me. However, the way I work at it is that I, I get a lot of help from my team. We're five here, so it's four plus me. I get a lot of help on my team into uh, to telling them, teaching them what's the way to prepare the field for being able to design a project. And this is basically what you learn at OMA so that you can start proposing concepts. Yeah. And so my team helps me out with analyzing the site, with coming up with both physical and 3D models that we can then start to making tests, with uh, analyzing the program of the client, uh, with making diagrams that help you understand the site. So we'll grab the site and we'll start uh, juxtaposing and putting on top plans from other buildings that we've done or projects that we know as references. And we slowly start to get to know the project, right? What the project wants to be. And then we have a brainstorming session. And so I only have one senior and the rest are juniors. And there, anybody's opinion on concept is valid as much as mine. And it's like the best idea wins. It's a battle of ideas. And then after that, it, I just curate like, okay, do this, make the building model this way. I need a section here. No, change this. And so there's an orchestration of the design. Now, in concept designs, they're mostly uh, busy working on CDs and DDs of stuff that's already going on processes. So I get to sometimes have to come up with a design myself because I can't take their time. Say, yeah. guys, I need you to brainstorm. So most of the concepts end up being mine in the way, right? Yeah. And that's more or less how it's working. Then of course, all the PR, for example, like stuff like this, talking to you, BD and the teaching side. And 90% of the people that for part of my team are ex-students. Fantastic. Amazing. And has, how, what's, I mean, we can't have a conversation without mentioning the pesky virus this year. Has, yeah. it, has it had a, a well, how, how have you been pivoting or adapting? It's, it's a good, it's a, it's a important point and an important point we need to discuss. And this, you know, this conversation will be recorded and then people can look back and, and hopefully there'll be better times or different times. You asked me if, how have I been growing the office? So we started 2019 with five people, yeah. including me, and we're still five people. So for me, that, that's a growth uh, yeah. in a way, having been able to maintain that. And actually, uh, I didn't give my senior the raise that he deserved, but I gave him a raise, which, you know, in this environment, that's, you know, that's winning already. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention, in, in this case, how we're dealing with COVID. The, the biggest project that we're working on, which is the headquarters for uh, a pharmaceutical company in Mexico. So I, I don't know names of pharmaceutical retailers in the UK, but in the US it would be like working for Walgreens. So Walgreens main office headquarters. Got it. Like that boots. was scary. Sorry? Boots would probably be the equivalent in the yeah. UK. Yeah. So that was scary with COVID because you are talking about a building that's 200,000 square foot. It's practically done. I mean, the facade was finishing and we're starting to go into interiors when March COVID hits yeah. and everybody starts rethinking, do we need offices, right? Everybody's working from home still. My team is not here. My team isn't at their houses. However, the pharmaceutical has gone straight ahead except for the fact that we, by the government, had to shut down construction for two months and that set us back, of course. Now, internally, if you remember the story, the office began me traveling in 2016 back and forth between Hong Kong and Mexico. So it was always remote. This Zoom environment, I had it since 2016 with my, with my team. We, we would use, uh, it was called a peer in, now it's called whereby, which is great because you don't need software. Yep. And in Hong Kong, I would have an 8 a.m. conference call and then an 11 p.m. conference call. And I would have very long naps during, the, during my lunch to be able to do that. And I would grab my team here at their end of their day or their beginning of their day. And that's how, you know, design would flow. Mm. 
And so the whole migration of working from the office to working at home, you know, my team took the computers from the office, set them up. It's worked perfectly. Actually, it's, it's too comfortable. It's, it's harder when it comes to modeling, like presenting a physical model. That's hard because mm-hmm. I can't make the models. Uh, and I don't like to send them out because that's really expensive. Usually yeah. those models are done in-house. It's harder to get discussions with clients at the beginning of the pandemic. They don't want to come here. I don't want to um, make them come here. Some can do Zoom, some can't. However, that side, you know, that's the other side. But internally as a team, as working on architecture projects, we didn't feel a difference. However, of course, the market changed. And that's, you know, we've, we've dealt with the blows. And if we didn't grow, we managed to stay the same size. Now, what I've heard from my clients and developers is that this year is about surviving. But next year, it's going to be really bad because there's going to be a very uh, stop. I don't know how to say that in English right now, but the flow is going to stop for new projects next year. The projects this year continued because they were already on site. There's going to be a drought for new yeah, projects. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to experience the sort of inactivity of the investors in the front end parts of the projects until later on Yeah, in next year. There's a kind of so lag. So take care of your expenses, big a piggy, build up a piggy bank and start kind of making strategies to understand that that low is going to come. It's going to be a bit of a drought. Yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. I think, I think that's probably a good place for us to, to conclude. Um, I just want to say, you know, massive thank you for, I mean, I I think there's plenty of other things I could pick your brains about and ask you, but I I think it's probably a good place to, uh, to wrap up the conversation, but thank you so much for sharing your experience and your expertise and how you're growing your, growing your own practice now. And, uh, I look forward to speaking again. Yeah. Ryan, anytime. And, you know, I usually take students to the Venice Biennale every two years. And so anytime that I find myself in Europe, I'll, I'll send you a message. It would be great if we can meet up. And if there's any other topic that we can discuss, you know, it'd be great. I want to thank you for inviting me on this. I follow you guys' uh, podcast. I think what you guys are doing is really important because, again, it's the idea of this, this, this studio. Yeah. We need to – so when offices go bankrupt, what happens is that the year before they go bankrupt – They put out mediocre work. Uh, They make their clients pretty angry with bad work and they underpay and overwork staff. So the more prepared we are on the business side to lead offices, the better the whole architecture community will be. And we won't be, also when when an office is struggling, they undercut their fees, which hurts the whole community as well. So the more prepared we are in these things, and of course, institutes like the REBA and the AAA work hard at this, but you know, not too many students end up at REBA and AIA. I think the, those institutes need to work hard in getting into schools and academia and doing stuff like this studio. So what you guys are doing, I think is incredibly valuable and I'm, I'm a fan. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And, you know, that's a very a, a pertinent point to, to end on really is that you know, to actually really take the reins and recognize that we're being business leaders, you know, and there's, there's something here to be a steward of and being a business leader ultimately underpins being a fantastic architect. Exactly, exactly. Wonderful, thank you very much. Ryan, thank you so much. Take care. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.